Hello and welcome to the Off Farm Income Podcast, episode number 007, Ideas for the Ultimate Lifestyle Business, Agriculture. Hey, this is your host, Matt Breckwald. Thank you very much for tuning in again today. And today, and on the Off Farm Income Podcast, we like to talk about everything agriculture and specifically ways to help you bring income back to your farm while you're getting that farm enterprise up and running and ways to help you work in agriculture, especially if you were like me and you thought it was impossible. So we'll continue that journey together today. Now, today's special guest is here to talk about a very unique agricultural service business, and that business is the business of controlling gophers and other burrowing rodents. And for any of you who are not tuning in for the first time, you probably know that that special guest today is going to be yours truly, me, myself, and I, Matt Breckwald, and that is the business that has inspired the Off Farm Income podcast and has inspired all of our interviews with other small agricultural service business owners. So this may be a little bit odd today for both of us, but I will be interviewing myself, but really what I want to do is provide you with the information about how I started my business and how I got that going. And this kind of serves a couple different purposes. One, it uh, gives you a good template for this type of agricultural service business and a good example but two, it kind of tells you why I've got some ability to be up here and be talking about these types of things and where I'm coming from and that I've actually gone out and done this myself. So we'll be talking about that and we will be uh, exploring some of those options. And then also I'll be kind of discussing how uh, the development of the podcast came about as well. Uh, because that is a new business of mine, obviously, um, and that business en- encapsulates not just the podcast here, but it encapsulates uh, myself doing public speaking, uh, business coaching, business consulting, and creating products and selling products. So it's kind of the next step in the evolution of my agricultural business, so we'll be discussing that a little bit. So before we begin, I want to say thank you again to all of you who have clicked through Amazon. I can't thank you enough. Um, Affiliate links are the way that we are producing income here at the Off Farm Income Podcast right now. Aside from uh, business consulting and speaking, and I really want to say thank you to those of you who are doing that. I very much appreciate it, and it helps us to continue to bring this content to you which we sincerely hope you're finding value in. Okay, so let's begin with our interview today, and that will be with me, but uh, discussing something very relevant, which is my business and how it developed, and also how I made the transition from that very secure, good paying with great benefits job into working for myself, living in the country, having a farm, selling and raising cattle, and doing those types of things. All right, so I begin every interview uh, by sending my interview questions to my guests and giving them a few days to peruse those questions and try to develop the best answers they can. So not all of these questions are spontaneous just to give you a little behind-the-scenes information on this, but I like to give my, my guests time to prep. And also we're asking them some very personal things about their businesses in the hopes that they'll share that information with you. So you can get a leg up and you uh, can avoid some of the mistakes that they've already made. So if there are questions there that they're uncomfortable with, I want them to have the chance to see those questions and to uh, let me know ahead of time. I don't know if I want to answer that one or something like that. So I start off every interview with this question. And the question is, tell me about you personally. Now, full disclosure, I stole that question from a gentleman who has probably, well, who has the most successful podcast out there. His name is John Lee Dumas, and his podcast name is Entrepreneur on Fire, and I've listened to that several times, Uh, namely, when I've been standing out in a field exterminating gophers with my small agricultural service business, and I've just been consuming podcast after podcast after podcast, and that's a question that he asks, and he's got a very... Uh, regimented question structure on his podcast. And so I've kind of stole some of that 
uh, or I'll just reframe that and say that I've been inspired by how he does his. And so I start off with every question with that question. So me personally, I am a father of one. I have an eight-year-old daughter named Hattie, and I've been married to my wife, Autumn, for 16 and a half years, and we live in Cuna, Idaho. We run a small 25-acre farm where we raise cattle, goats, pigs, and chickens, and we grow alfalfa. And really, our main focus on the farm is beef, cattle, uh, raising cattle, and then direct marketing those cattle to individual customers who want to... uh, be able to come out and see the farm where their beef is being raised and shake the hand of the person who's raising it. And so we'll raise up those steers and we will finish them and then we will deliver them to the butcher and our customers will pick them up from the butcher. And that's really our business model. And right now we're producing an excess of hay, so I'm selling hay as well. And then the pigs, uh, that's developing as well to where we can do the same thing with pork and direct market um pigs to our customers as well. Now, I am a veteran police officer. I spent 15 years in law enforcement working both in California as a police officer and then eventually in Idaho as a police officer. And I spent the last 12 years of my life, well, I shouldn't say the last 12 years, but I spent the last 12 years of my career as a police officer here in Boise, Idaho, where I did Oh, a bunch of stuff. I was a school resource officer, a patrol officer, a special victims unit detective, a sergeant, a field training officer. And so I was working myself right along in that career. And I hit a point, probably about 2009, honestly, where I thought, okay, the season for this career is kind of past and I'm moving into a new season in my life, which by the way is okay. That happens to everybody. And I don't know that this is where I want to stay, I'd like to move on and try something different. And I had just some sort of an inner pull to do something entrepreneurial. And I started searching for the answer to that question and trying to figure out what I was going to do that was going to satisfy that entrepreneurial pull. Uh, This tends to be a long story, but I started a consulting business that had to do with security because, of course, I was a police officer, and I just did not have the passion for that business that I started. I am still convinced to this day that it is a fantastic idea, but without the passion, you know, that's one of the three elements that has to be there to make a business successful, and I just did not have it, and so that sits in the vault of Great Ideas by Matt Breckwald, but that one, uh, I did try and implement it, but I failed and never got one customer. And really, the failure came because I was pretty much done with with law enforcement and with criminal justice in that sense of it, actually going out and implementing it and doing those types of things. So that failed, but I still spent all of my time consuming books and podcasts about running your own business, about looking at things with a different perspective, I just wasn't going to fit into the mold of somebody who spent an entire career at one location or even an entire career with one company or an entire career as an employee. I definitely was getting pulled towards working for myself. That lifestyle was very attractive to me, and I really couldn't think about anything other than that lifestyle and working for myself. So several years went by, And my wife and I looked at ourselves one day as Hattie was getting to be about five years old and getting ready to start school. And we realized that we had lived in the city of Boise, which, by the way, is a great city. Uh, Nothing against the city of Boise at all. But we had lived inside of the city of Boise for, oh, it had been nearly 12 years, 13 years. And that had never been our intention. Autumn had grown up on a cattle ranch down in Buell, Idaho, and I had grown up in a very rural small town called Valley Home, California, a town of about 40 people, and that was all rice farmers and cattle ranchers and dairies when I grew up. And I had gotten involved in agriculture in high school uh, through my stepfather's and step-grandfather's farm where they were raising cattle. Got very interested in cattle, and I had gone off to college and got a degree 
in animal science from Montana State University and that entire time through college worked on a bunch of different cattle ranches and had definitely always been interested in agriculture. So I didn't know how to achieve that. I didn't have a ranch or a farm that I was going to inherit or go back to. And when I finished with college, I didn't really have any careers in agriculture that I was super interested in and wanted to do. I had got a job offer from a company that I had done two internships with. That was Zeneca Agricultural Products. And with that company, I had sold agricultural products as a wholesaler or as a wholesale rep to retailers and fertilizer companies in western Idaho and western Montana. And that just did not appeal to me. I didn't want to go into sales. I didn't want to go be a ranch manager. I had worked on a number of different ranches for different owners and that can be tiring. I got to be honest with you, that can be a little bit tiring and that just did not appeal to me at that point. And I didn't know what to do and I had this interest in law enforcement and I thought I'm going to go back home and I'm going to be a sheriff's deputy where I grew up. I'm going to patrol the mean streets of Valley Home, California and that sheriff's car that I used to admire as a young man and that's what I'm going to do. And so I shifted my focus and I went to the police academy back in Modesto, California and I became a police officer down there. I didn't get hired by the sheriff's office right away. And I finally did about after two years working as a city police officer in a city called Tracy. I went over to the Stanislaus County Sheriff's Office where I had ultimately wanted to work and that did not work out. I was disappointed and I couldn't believe after all of that, I was so disappointed. I I had high hopes of moving my way into an agricultural investigations position there. I had the ag degree and the love for agriculture and I thought I could marry law enforcement with that passion together because there were positions there investigating agricultural theft but it just didn't work out and so Autumn and I were married by that time and I've got got the opportunity to move back to Idaho to her home state and work as herdsman on a cattle ranch and I took it and so I left law enforcement came back to Idaho and I became herdsman on a cattle ranch down around Burley, Idaho and after about a year that ranch went under The experience was the same as it had been before where uh, while the ranch manager that I worked for was absolutely brilliant and taught me a lot and knew better than anybody I've ever met how to make money in the cattle business, it wasn't always as rewarding of an experience as I wanted it to be. So when that ranch went under, we decided that is that and we are moving back to Boise and we're going back to school. And so we decided we were both going to be school teachers but I got into the public school teaching master's degree program at Boise State University and decided that there was just no way I could do that I wasn't going to be able to hang in that program and so I left it I enrolled in the master's program there in criminal justice and I went back into law enforcement and I got hired by the Boise Police Department and went to work there as a police officer in 2001 I got my master's degree in 2006, December of 2006. I finally finished that, and I started teaching college, uh, teaching criminal justice and policing courses uh, at the college level and continued on with my career in law enforcement. So anyway, this is a very long way of saying that ultimately I found myself 12, 13 years later living in the city, about to start our daughter in school in the city, had a city job, was doing everything in the city, and wondering how in the world that had happened when Autumn and I had had goals to have our own farm, our own ranch, and have our own cattle, and we were nowhere closer to that at that point in time than when we first got married. And so we started shopping, and we had shopped before, but we found a farm. We found a farm we could afford. It had um, as many acres as we'd ever seen on a place for sale around Boise, and it was in our our price range, it was close to Boise, and we decided to jump on it. So we bought that farm, and there was some fate involved there. We made an offer, it got rejected. Two more offers came in, they both got rejected, and then the owner dropped the price, and we made another offer, and we got the place. And we were ecstatic, there's a lot of work to do, and as a matter of fact, we're kind of entering the final phase this year of developing this farm, but there was a lot of work to do. And we got to work on that. Well, once we moved out to the country and once we started farming and developing this, I started to realize that that pool for entrepreneurialism was still there. And now I was living kind of two separate lives. 
I worked four days in the city as a police officer. Then I would come home. I wouldn't go anywhere near the city. And I'd stay out in my new community, stay out on the farm, and just love life and not want to go back to the city. And I was kind of living two separate lives. One where I lived in the country and wanted to be devoted to my small community and agriculture. And one where I was a city person going into the city. And I decided something has got to change about this. So what happened was we discovered a machine called a perk. And that was advertised in an agricultural newspaper that they have out here in the West that covers California, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho called the Capital Press. And the developer of that machine was advertising it there. And I saw that machine in the paper and I thought, there it is. There's the business. That looks like a good business, something that I can go do. Well, I talked myself out of that about four or five times. I chickened out, wouldn't pull the trigger, wouldn't buy the equipment, wouldn't start the business. And never did anything. Well, then Autumn and I took a course through the University of Idaho Extension Service called Living on the Land. And basically what that was going to do was fill in the gaps for us on the things we didn't know about managing our small acreage. And teach us about those things. Because we knew plenty about cattle, but we knew very little about managing a small acreage. And during that class, the instructor asked the 35 or so participants what their biggest pet peeve and number one problem on their farm was, and 100% of the people raised their hand and said it was gophers. And I couldn't believe how many people had a problem with gophers. So I started doing a little more intensive research into this machine. I contacted somebody who lived about 55 miles away named Rod Zier, who owns a uh, similar gopher control company to me in Ontario, Oregon, and took him out to lunch and asked him all about the business, and he was very generous with his information, took me to his place and showed me he had two machines that he and his father used to operate their business, showed me the machine, was very honest with me about the business, about the potential revenue, about how the machine worked, uh, about how effective it was, and gave me a really good point of reference on whether or not I was going to purchase this machine. I also called around the country and talked to a number of applicators Uh, namely in Colorado, that were using the same machine for prairie dogs and got very good reviews on it as well. And then you know what I did? I chickened out again. I chickened out again. This was about February of 2012, and I chickened out again. And I went back to my 40-hour-a-week job, and I can remember just being at that job on Monday morning or whatever the first day of my week was and thinking to myself, this is just the way it is. People like me don't get to go live that lifestyle that those entrepreneurs out there get to live. People like me are going to have somebody else dictating to them until they retire when they have to be at work, where they have to be, and what they have to do. And that's just the life that I'm destined to lead. And about two months later, I literally woke up in the middle of the night, eyes wide open, wide awake, not groggy at all thinking, what am I doing? I need to order this machine. I need to start this business. And if I don't order it soon, I'm going to miss the entire 2012 season because gopher control is a tad bit seasonal. So I woke up the next day. I talked to Autumn. I said, I want to order this machine. I want to start this business. I think it'll work. I'm scared to death. I might waste all of our money. I don't know if it will, but I've done all the research I can do. I've done market research. I've talked to applicators. I think it's going to work. Can we do this? And she said, yeah, do it. It's all you talk about, working for yourself. Go do it. So I ordered the machine in early May. Uh, The manufacturer had to build it for me and then freight it from Tule Lake, California to me in CUNA. It arrived on about the 18th of May 2012, somewhere like that. And I had my first paying customer off of a Craigslist ad on May 25th of 2012 And we have been going ever since. So the company's name is Idaho Gopher Control. And it's got its own website. If you guys want to check it out, feel free. It's IdahoGopherControl.com. Very, very simple. And what I do is I service both residential, small acreage, and agricultural customers. And I control their gophers. I exterminate their gophers. I also exterminate ground squirrels and voles and occasionally rock chucks, or if you are not familiar with that term, it's a marmot. 
and really that's what I have to exterminate in Idaho. We don't have moles. Um, you can use this machine for moles. You can use this machine for prairie dogs, but we just don't have those where I am at. So regionally, I'm limited to voles, ground squirrels, and gophers, with gophers being the main point of emphasis of the business. And it works great. The machine works great. It, it worked out very well. And so now um, I have developed that business further. I'm hiring an employee this spring, uh, which is a big step in what appears to be a very, very right direction for me and for this business. And uh, we've added services. We've added some products uh, to the business, some some pricing plans, guarantees, and we've been developing it. I've de- been developing the website over the last few years and have really been transitioning with that. But really the overview is that we're exterminators of gophers. We started the business to... Uh, work in rural communities and work in agriculture and one of my goals with this podcast as well as with my small business is to provide uh, a way to help revitalize and bring jobs to rural communities so I'm really excited about this spring because I'm going to be able to bring one of those jobs to my rural community Uh, for somebody who wants to not commute into the city every day they'll have the opportunity to work in agriculture out away from the city and stay in our smaller community. And also, uh, it's been a wonderful uh, way for me to give back to the community we live in. Uh, I am able to uh, donate our services to the FFA auction we have in CUNA every September, and so they can auction off some of my gopher control. And it's been, it's been great and a great way to get involved in the community. All right, so in the podcast interview questions, uh, the next question is, give me an overview of your business. I just answered that. How did you pick the business? Well, I, I kind of told you how I did pick it. it. It was I was searching. You know, there's a saying out there. I think the saying goes something like, uh, when the student is ready, the, the master will appear. Well, when the entrepreneur is ready, I think the business will appear. For years, I was caught up in this idea that, I had to figure out what my passion was. Don't even waste your time with something until you figure out what your passion is because if it's not your passion, you're not going to be able to do any good at it. And I finally gave up on that and said, I just need to find a business because right now anything sounds better than my regimented, rigorous, 40-hour-a-week job. And so I started this business, and something I've discovered since then is that passion develops over time. I have definitely got passion for this business, as silly as it may sound. And by the way, the looks I got from family and friends when they realized I was leaving a very, very good career in law enforcement to go exterminate gophers, which they didn't understand at all, those were priceless. Uh, They don't understand. I didn't understand. And they don't understand how in the world I could have any passion for this. But I do. And my passion comes from developing this business and growing this business and being successful at the business. Do I have a passion for exterminating gophers? Not necessarily, but I have a passion for doing a great job for my customers and being the best that I can possibly be. And that was something I had to discover by just going out and doing it and starting the business. And so that's been a really big plus in doing this as I finally figured out the key or the quiz to that question of where is your passion? What is your passion? Well, you find your passion as you go forth and you start doing these things. Okay, so how do I market this business? Well, you know, honestly, when I began, all I did was I put an ad up on Craigslist and I tried to develop a good ad on Craigslist. Craigslist is free. It gives you a lot of space uh, to write and to put in pictures and things like that. So instead of just putting up a two-line ad that says, got gophers, I'll take care of them, I tried to explain who I was and what I did and what I could offer people. And Craigslist was great. It was fantastic. And as I went along that first summer that I was starting this, that's all I used was Craigslist. Now, I did develop some business cards that I could hand out to people, but most of the time that was after they had already hired me or called me from the Craigslist ad. So I used Craigslist and that was absolutely wonderful and it generated me a ton of business that first summer, that summer of 2012. And I was shocked actually at the amount of demand there was for this business uh, just in our our valley here in the metro area of Boise, Idaho. 
but there was quite a bit of demand for the business. So the next year, I decided to add some things to my marketing plan. I developed a website and started building that and putting up information, but I wasn't getting any hits on the website. And simply, it wasn't coming up in Google search rankings uh, when people were doing searches on the internet and nobody else knew about it. So I really had it at that point just to look more professional. So I could have a website listed on my business card and people could go to it and they could go, okay, this guy's a legitimate business. Uh, He's not just a fly-by-night guy who I'm not going to be able to rely on. I also made some flyers and went out and I hung those at different like farm and ranch stores, rural grocery stores, places like that in the hopes to catch some people's eyes. I got some magnetic signs made and put those on my pickup. So when I was going down the road with my very odd looking gopher extermination machine uh, that drew people's attention on my pickup, they'd see the signs and they'd figure out what it was I was doing. And then I got with a buddy Uh, who has some experience, a lot of experience writing and a lot of experience dealing with public relations. And we made some media releases. And this was fantastic. I paid him for the media releases. I paid him a flat fee per media release. And then I paid him a flat fee for every time that I got either on television, on the radio, or in a magazine or a newspaper article. And we submitted this media release, and the response was immediate. I had television interviews. I got printed up in magazines. I got interviewed several times for magazines, for newspapers, and I also did a radio interview. And that that method of marketing uh, got me a lot of free publicity. And really the secret here is that every you've all heard the term a slow news day. Every media outlet has a slow news day. Some media outlets have nothing but slow news days because in their niche or in their genre, there's not a whole lot of content and coming up with content is very difficult. And so I provided them with content, something that they could fill in and they could use if they had a slot. And even news news stations used it and did an interview with a news station. And so that worked very well. I got a lot of business. So the investment in the media releases, what I paid my friend who created and distributed these for me, easily paid for itself. It paid for itself 10 times over, no question about it. And then the one radio interview that I did as a result of the media release actually landed me a very, very large contract uh, with the city of Boise. And that worked out and paid. That was a wonderful boon to um, my business in 2013. That was a great, great um, thing that happened when that radio interview came out. So that was really the main marketing method I used in 2013. And I continued to develop my, uh, my website and my other marketing tools. Then as the season slowed down in the fall of 2013, I was becoming very inspired I was becoming uh, extremely inspired about uh, my business. I had left my full-time day job, so I had left that in June of 2013, and I had given up uh, the state retirement. I had given up all my seniority, my time off, my good salary, uh, my prestige, my rank, all of that. I had given that all up, but I was at this point inspired I was going to go make this happen. So by the fall of 2013, that's where I was at. And so what I did with this inspiration was I wrote a very heartfelt thank you letter to every customer who had hired me in 2012 and 2013. And I individualized each one of those letters and I mailed those letters out at Christmas time. A lot of you guys uh, listeners will get letters from friends and family at Christmas, Christmas, the kind of details their year. Well, I just told my story in my letter. So I sent it to each and every one of them saying, thank you very much, explaining to them, you know, that we had moved our daughter from the city to the country. We're trying to raise her with rural uh, uh, country and, and farming type values and what we were doing, how I had broken away from law enforcement after 15 years and how this was a dream and a new thing we were venturing into and introduce them to my family and let them get to know me a lot better than they had known me just as somebody they hired to exterminate their gophers and sent that out around Christmas time. And then in 
when the season started up in 2014, it started up in about February of 2014, I noticed that my referral business and my repeat business was going through the roof. I was getting way more than I had ever experienced in those first two seasons. And I attribute that directly to that letter I sent out at Christmas. And of course, I got comments from people when I went back to their houses that they had no idea that I'd been a police officer or they'd read my letter and they thought that the story was great and they were so happy they could help. And so I saw the positive benefits from that letter right away. And the other thing it did too is that when in the middle of winter, uh, when there's snow on the ground here and the ground is frozen and people are not outside, either work in their fields or working in their gardens or whatever it may be, gophers are out of sight and out of mind. But it kept them, uh, kept me in their mind in terms of um, here's our resource, here's our go-to person uh, for this particular problem when it comes up. So the spring of 2014 started and I started getting a lot of repeat business and I started getting a lot of referral business and that's the first thing I noticed in 2013. So all of a sudden word of mouth marketing is really what started to work for me in the first half of 2014 was just people talking about me. I would ask customers where they found out about me and all of a sudden they were finding out about me from different cities, from different canal companies and irrigation districts which these are not places that I had ever gone and given my information to, but word had spread that there was a resource out there doing this and providing this service and taking care of this problem, and my my business began to grow. And something else I did during the off-season from 2013 to 2014 is I started writing. I got myself published in a couple different magazines. I did some research on civil liability in terms of gophers. I did some research on... Uh, injuries to horses uh, for people who have horses and they also have burrowing rodents and I wrote up some articles and generated some interest in those articles and they got published in different magazines I got interviewed one of them they just uh, had me as a guest writer and they published my article another one I got interviewed in got a couple more interviews and then I started to put out some videos on YouTube demonstrating how to use the machine uh, put out some videos talking about different aspects of dealing with gophers and we're not talking about me getting 10,000 views or uh, you know half a million hits on a video or something like that but I definitely did get interest from around the country on those articles and on those videos and all of a sudden it started to change how my website was showing up in search engine rankings and now all well I shouldn't say all of my business but now easily 9 out of 10 customers when I asked them how they found out about me tell me that they went onto the internet, typed in some search terms, and my website popped up. And that was the first one they saw. They liked the website. There's a lot of information on there. I encourage you to go there and look at it. Again, it's IdahoGopherControl.com. There's a lot of information there. I continue to try and improve it. And I developed and started developing trust with those customers when they went to the website, saw that I was a professional business, and then saw the information that was there and how transparent I am about who I am, what I'm doing, and obviously I'm trying to provide them as much information as possible on that website. So that is a very long way of telling you how I market my business, but I'm using all of those tools and I'm continuing to develop those tools. Now I've expanded into public speaking. This fall, fall of 2014, I was able to go out and start a public speaking career. I actually got paid to speak and did some speaking to, I spoke to about 120 farmers in two different presentations, and I'm continuing to develop that, and uh, that has been great as well. And doors just keep opening as I keep kind of getting outside of the box and expanding on this business. Those speaking opportunities led to me selling some of the equipment that I use, and I started receiving some commission income for selling some of that equipment. So once you get the ball rolling and you start, developing and you develop that passion for making the business work you start to see doors open that you never imagined were there before and so I really encourage you if you've got the idea to get started to try it because you just there's no way to know uh, what the possibilities coming your way in the future on this are and you're not going to know about those until you get going and they open up to you okay so how did I fund my business at the beginning Well, in all honesty, I refinanced my pickup. So the pickup that pulls around uh, the gopher machine, I refinanced it. 
Now, Autumn and I had the money put aside where we could have cash flowed the whole thing, but that was part of an emergency fund we had set aside. If any of you listen to Dave Ramsey, that's where the idea came from. And if any of you listen to Dave Ramsey, you know that I totally flew in the face of what he recommends because I borrowed money to start it. Uh, It cost about $12,000 for me to start my business. That is soup to nuts. That is everything. That's marketing, business cards, uh, buying a trailer to carry the equipment on, buying the equipment itself, having it freighted out to me, doing everything I needed to do, starting the website to start the business. And so I borrowed right in the neighborhood of $12,000 to buy the equipment and to get going and then paid that off extremely quickly. The business uh, worked out very well. In my case, the business has very, very low overhead. $12,000 sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot of money to start a business. And the return on the investment has been fantastic. I've re- I've got great margins in this business. And uh, the return on investment has been fantastic. So it's paid for itself and that debt is taken care of. Uh, but that is how I funded it at the beginning. And really, we could have cash flowed it, but that would have taken our bank accounts down to zero. And maybe that's the way we should have done it, but that is not the way that we did do it. Uh, At what point in the development of my business did I realize it was going to work? Well, I'll tell you, my eyes were open that very first summer. Summer of 2012, I could not believe both what, uh, what I was able to do in terms of finding customers, and I couldn't believe the demand for my business uh, here, that there was that many people that wanted to learn about exterminating gophers, or excuse me, there was that many people that needed gophers exterminated. And there was a trip we took at spring break in 2013 where I found a guy in Los Angeles. We escaped the snow and cold and went down to the beach. And on our way through Los Angeles, I found a guy down there running a gopher control business and I contacted him and took him out to lunch Hopefully you're noticing the recurring theme about being proactive here. And I took him out to lunch and talked to him about his business and couldn't believe that he had the identical business to me, but he was serving five counties down around Los Angeles and he had multiple trucks running and he had a huge business going just dealing with gophers. It blew me away. So I never even knew it existed, um, but it was definitely that first summer where I went, wow, there's really something here. I can't believe it which led me to leaving my, my career job uh, the following summer. All right, so what are the three most important pieces of advice that I would give to somebody who wanted to start a business similar to mine and grow it to my level? Well, I think you probably know the first one I'm going to tell you is learn how to market your business. I talked for about 15 minutes about marketing mine, and that's been what's been really fun for me in developing this business as well as the marketing part of it. And I have no education in marketing other than books that I've read and podcasts I've listened to. But throughout my entire college experience, I never took one marketing class. So learning to market your business has been great. Uh, It's been very, very fun. And that's my number one piece of advice. Number two is to position yourself as an expert. Get out there and find a way, uh, whether it be through media releases, writing articles, doing videos on YouTube, or going out and speaking, position yourself as an expert Make people comfortable with you in this business to the point that they will hire you and trust you because they believe you are an expert. And by the way, I say position yourself as an expert. It almost sounds like I'm saying go out and fool people. I'm not saying that at all. When you go out and you start a business and you do all the research, you're going to feel like you still don't know anything, but you're going to know so much more than everybody else out there that you truly are an expert. You just have to put yourself out there as one. So definitely want to do that. And then Piece of advice number three, you've got to believe in your product or service. When I first started trying to sell my service, all I had was the research I had done and what the manufacturer said about the equipment. That's all I had. I didn't have any real world experience on how well this equipment worked. And as soon as I started getting very good results where I was really pleasing customers and I was legitimately getting rid of their gophers, a problem they'd never been able to fix and I could come in and fix it, the confidence that I had in my service went through the roof. And boy, once my confidence skyrocketed in terms of how well my service worked, my ability to sell that service went through the roof as well. I rarely, rarely have people call me now 
who are inquiring about my service who do not hire me. When I first started out, I was probably converting 20 to 50% of the prospective customers that would call me or that I'd be in contact with. Now I'm converting almost 100%. And that is directly relatable to the fact that I have got a ton of confidence in my service. And you have to have that too. If you don't believe your product or your service is going to work, you shouldn't be selling it until you either fix it to the point where it is going to work or you move on to something that will. Okay. Did I write a business plan before I started? No. I went on to the Small Business Administration website. I looked at the business planning materials. I did a ton of research. And with my first consulting business, I did follow the Small Business Administration's website and tried to fill out that huge business plan. But the whole time I was doing it, I was only doing it because it was there and I thought that's what I was supposed to do. It never it never grabbed me. I never could figure out why I was doing this or how this was helping me. And I just did it. So with the gopher business, I didn't do it. I had a plan in my head. I may have jotted a few notes down. But did I write a formal business plan? No, I did not. And by the way, I have not interviewed anybody yet who did. And the people I've interviewed are running good and successful businesses. Now, don't take that the wrong way. I am not trying to say that not to do this. It's not going to hurt you at all to write a business plan. And quite honestly, it's probably the better course of business. But I didn't do it. I just knew that I needed to bring in more than was going out. I needed to market a business and I needed to develop a business. Now, I wasn't seeking venture capital. I wasn't going to the bank and asking for a big loan uh, or anything like that. I did borrow money, but it was a secured loan on my pickup. Uh, so I, I didn't need that super formal business plan to get my business funded. I started small. I started with a small business and I found something and really very lucky in the way I found this, but I found something that has low overhead and low uh, cost of operation and really high margins. And so very lucky in that respect, but no, no business plan. Did I incorporate my business or form an LLC? I did. Uh, forming an LLC was very simple this is different from state to state, and I am by no means an expert in every state, but in Idaho, this was very easy. I just went to the Secretary of State's office, filled out the necessary paperwork, wrote a check for $100, I think, and all of a sudden, I had an LLC. And so now I could separate my company from my personal assets, and I could shield myself from any potential liability um, from what went on with the company. And I maintain the LLC uh, today and for, at least for this business I will not let that go it will remain in LLC now I haven't had any problems in terms of liability or litigation or accidents or anything like that but of course you just never know when that might come up so the LLC became very important a few words of caution an LLC protects you if you do it right if you form an LLC but you continue to commingle uh, your family's property and your family's funds and money with your business funds and money and things like that, then all of a sudden that protection that the LLC provides you kind of, it, it, it will go away because there's no way to distinguish what belongs to the business and what belongs to the company or excuse me, what belongs to the family and what belongs to the business. So I am very strict about keeping the two things separate, spinning out of completely different bank accounts and not commingling those funds for personal and business use. Uh, what is the one piece of equipment that you must have to get started? Well, in my case, it was the PERC, or the pressurized exhaust rodent control machine. I needed that to start the business on the scale that I wanted the business to operate in. Now, for somebody who simply wants to get in started in the gopher extermination business, because by the way, there is a ton of demand for this business out there. You may have never experienced this with gophers, but when people get gophers in their yard or their garden or their small acreage or their farm and they can't get rid of them, they become passionate about getting rid of these little critters and they are fired up. I've had customers before with just one gopher where I felt almost guilty because I've got a flat fee in my business saying, you know, you might want to try this or you might want to try that before you hire me, almost talking them out of hiring me because for one gopher I felt like it was too expensive and I've had them yell at me on the phone telling me they do not care about the money. Get out here and kill this little bugger. 
So if you want to start a gopher control business like I did, you can start it with extremely low overhead with probably 10 traps, uh, 10 traps at $8 a piece, $80 in an add on Craigslist. And as long as you do a good job for people, you will grow and you will be able to expand. I chose one model of this business. I wanted to be a larger scale, very professional business, but certainly you can go out and buy some traps and you can get started. Um, and that would be an essential piece of equipment if you want to start at the base level uh, in this particular business. How did I find customers? Well, like I said before, I started with Craigslist. It spread to word of mouth. I started developing those relationships and then started developing the website and positioning myself as an expert. And the customers started to appear. And they've been growing and my prospects have been growing every season since then. How much money is started needed to start a business like mine? You know, honestly, I had a pickup already. Uh, if you didn't have anything, if you didn't have a pickup and you didn't have a trailer and you didn't have an ATV to pull the perk on and you wanted to start my exact business, you would need about $20,000 to begin. It took me $12,000 to get my trailer and the perk. I already had the ATV and the pickup. But uh, for another 8000 you can easily find a suitable pickup to pull your trailer around and a suitable ATV to pull the perk around if, uh, if you needed to do it that way. So easily with $20,000, you could start this business. And if you've already got a truck um, or any of those other pieces of equipment, then it's just going to be even cheaper uh, to begin this business. And I know that might sound like a lot, but think about it. You've probably a decent chance you've got a $20,000 automobile sitting in your driveway. If you really want to work for yourself and you really want to break away from that regimented 40-hour-a-week life with somebody else telling you what to do, then what are you willing to sacrifice to get there? I sacrificed a lot to get there, and I would never go back. I would never go back. I shouldn't say never. I would go back. If we went into a depression, if we went into a, a situation where I absolutely had to do that, of course I would do that to feed my family and to support my family. But given a choice between the two, I would never go back. This lifestyle that uh, has developed out of being self-employed so far has been everything that people said it would be. It has been fantastic. And I don't ever want to go back uh, to having somebody else tell me where to be and when to be there. Certainly my customers do to an extent, but you still feel completely autonomous when you're serving your customers. Uh, but... And I'm not disgruntled or anything like that, but the lifestyle itself is great. It's worth the sacrifice. I took a significant pay cut when I started this business uh, from my job as a sergeant with the Boise Police Department. And it's been worth every penny of pay cut that I took. So, enough said on that. How did I get my startup capital? Well, like I said, we had it, uh, but we went out and borrowed it uh, to keep that money in the bank. Probably not the smartest way of doing things, but that is the way we did it. How have I grown my business? Well, I kind of described that when talking about marketing. But the ways it's grown now is I've grown it into speaking. I've grown it into publishing. I've grown it into selling products on my website. So I'm selling gopher products, uh, trapping products, and things like that. Squirrel products, vol products on my website. I'm producing videos and now selling some of the equipment that I use to exterminate gophers. So it's grown and developed in that way. And then we've also expanded to where we've got some different uh, service type plans, different guarantees, and different ways of uh, getting funded by customers. What time of the year are we busiest? We get really busy in April. Uh, as soon as people start to get back out in their yards, people who are enthusiastic about their yards and their farms and their gardens start to call. And then in the West, we grow a lot of alfalfa, and alfalfa is absolutely the favorite meal for a gopher. They love alfalfa fields. And so in June, at least here in Idaho, right after the first cutting of alfalfa comes off and people discover how many gophers they've got living down there in their alfalfa fields, we start getting a lot of calls. And so that's a very busy time of year. And I'll tell you, as the business has developed, it's been amazing to me, but this year, uh, at least in 2014, December was a great month for our business, which I would have never expected. We had a warm December here, which allowed me to keep working, and I was just as busy as I was in almost any other month of the year. So really the spring and then uh, probably early summer are the busiest times of year in this region 
for this business. Uh, is this business my sole form of income? No, it's not. And I have no problem with that being the case at all. I told you that when uh, Autumn and I moved to Boise and we went back to school, I went and got my master's degree in criminal justice and I started teaching college. I absolutely love teaching. Love, love, love teaching. And that's part of the inspiration behind this podcast as well. And so I continue to teach and now I'm teaching at the College of Western Idaho in Nampa as well as Boise, Idaho. And I've started teaching more classes on a part-time basis. I'm not a full-time employee there. And I've been very honest with my supervisor that I don't want to be. I, I want to remain a part-time employee and continue developing my business. But I continue to teach college on a part-time basis. And I'm able to do that and work that around my business. And that is really the only connection I still have to criminal justice or to policing is teaching about criminal justice, and I just don't want to give that up. I really enjoy teaching. We also make some money off of our farm, and so that's another revenue source we have. And then we have some rental property that we bought, and we make some money off the rental property as well. And in my readings and in my uh, journey to try and find this lifestyle that I've been seeking and am now living, one of the things I read about was creating multiple streams of income. And I've got to tell you, that's that's exactly where I'm at now, is I've got multiple streams of income. And so much is made of job security. And what I read was if you have multiple streams of income, you have to lose all those streams simultaneously to lose your job, to lose your income. Versus if you've got one job, all you have to do is lose that one job and you no longer have any income. And so I changed my perspective and I changed the way I was thinking to developing multiple streams of income. And I don't think I will ever go back to one source of income again either. And so that has been very good. So now in order for me to lose my income, I have to have my rental houses go vacant, my teaching job go away, the farm dry up, and the hundreds of customers I have in the gopher business simultaneously not hire me again. Now that could potentially happen, I suppose, but I think the odds of that are very low, and I think the odds of that happening are way lower than one employer going out of business or one employer saying you can no longer work here for whatever reason that may be. So no, it's not my sole form of income, and I don't think it ever will be. I think I will always keep irons in different fires uh, to keep that security and really to keep that stimulus going. It's very exciting to be uh, working and generating income creatively in different areas. Okay, so next question is, what was stopping you from becoming an entrepreneur? You know, my last interview with Jennifer Worth, and she said, nothing, nothing was stopping me from becoming an entrepreneur. And boy, does that make me jealous. I'll tell you right now, there was multiple forces lining up against me to stop me from becoming an entrepreneur. Number one, first and foremost, the one that almost everybody has to face is fear. I was scared. I was convinced that other people could create and run businesses. That was for other people. That was not for me. I was an employee, not an entrepreneur. And I was scared. All I could think about were all the bad things that could happen. And I could never concentrate on the potential good things. So fear was number one. And I really had to do, a, for me to overcome that fear, I had to do a lot of research to the point where, I had to sit down and tell myself, think logically about this process, not emotionally, because fear is an emotion. And when I thought logically, I said, the research is there, the potential income is there, the return on investment is there, everything lines up well, the demand for the, the product is there, everything is there. The only thing that you see that's a negative is your fear, which is just an emotion, but from a logical standpoint, it all looks good. So fear was number one. Number two, and I never knew about this until I read a book that I'm going to promote in this podcast, but number two was a concept called resistance that was coined uh, by Stephen Pressfield, uh, an author I'll talk to you about in a little while. And resistance was significant. All the different things that would come up during the day to stop me from achieving my goals, whether they be distractions, um, it could be fear again, it could be uh, prioritizing incorrectly 
or just allowing myself to be distracted, just ways to allow myself to get off course and not achieve those goals that I wanted to achieve. Resistance uh, was significant. And then third, and I'm speaking to you people out there who are in the position I was in five years ago, third were what I call the golden handcuffs. And I didn't invent that term, but boy, does it make sense. At my job with Boise PD, I had a very good job, very, very good employer, and a very good place to work. I had a ton of time off, so I had a lot of vacation. And then when we worked overtime, we could choose to take that as comp time, which gave us an hour and a half off for every um, every hour we worked of overtime. So I had a ton of time off. I had very good pay. I had a state retirement system, so I had a pension. I had a matching 401k or for public employee was a 457. I had very good benefits and health insurance. Um, I had seniority. I had a lot of respect in my community and my family and my friends because of the job I did. And I had to give all of that up to leave. But notice I was saying I had very good, very good, very good. Now there's a term out there that good is the opposite of great. I had it very good. I wanted it to be great. And I was willing to sacrifice money and benefits to have a great lifestyle. Now I am not without benefits and neither is my family. We have health care insurance now. But we had to change some things around, and it costs us more to have it now. But again, I wouldn't trade it back. Those golden handcuffs, you've got to break out of those sometimes because good is the enemy of great. And if you stick with what's good, you're never going to get to know what great is. And in terms of lifestyle, I now know what that looks like and do not want to go back. Okay, what is the best business advice I have ever received. Well, I received this from a man that I've never met personally. His name is Dan Miller, and he's got a podcast called 48 Days to the Work. Well, he wrote a book called 48 Days to the Work You Love, and the podcast is called 48 Days uh, Internet Radio. But what I heard listening to him, and I've been listening to him since 2009, is that once you develop your product or service, you're only 10% done. You know, once I bought the perk, And once I put an ad on Craigslist, it wasn't over. The money didn't just start rolling in. I was just getting started. And once you paint that painting or once you write that book or once you hang out your shingle that you're going to do X, Y, or Z, you know, it's not, you're not done. You're 10% finished. Now it's time to go out and market that business and make people understand why they need it and prove to people that you're worth it. And so that has been a great piece of business advice because it keeps me moving forward. It keeps me plugging along. Uh, Please share a personal habit that contributes to my success. Well, that personal habit has to be moving forward. It has to be overcoming that resistance and making progress. There are days, sometimes weeks, where I make only a small amount of progress. But as long as I'm moving in the correct direction, it's still progress. And that's a big deal to me. And, you know, this podcast that you're listening to right now, that's been a dream of mine for a while. And here it is out on iTunes, on Stitcher, it's on my website, and people are listening to it. We're over 700 downloads now, and it's on, this is the seventh episode. So, to me, that is surreal. But for the longest time, uh, that was a dream. I didn't know if I would ever achieve it. It seemed like things kept getting in the way this year, 2014 was a very busy year for my gopher business. I've been getting the ability to teach a lot more classes. And so life has just kind of got in the way. And so there were months sometimes where I would look back on the month and go, well, I'm further along now than I was at the beginning of the month. I'm not anywhere close to as far along as I projected myself to be, but at least I'm still moving forward. And that is something that I've kept doing. And it, just this week, I'm, I've been looking back on things, that I've, things I've got up on my website now, uh, things I have going on with the podcast. And I see the goals that I've accomplished that it's, I can remember six months ago looking at those going, I don't know how I'm ever going to get these things done. And now they're done. And they're done simply because I kept moving forward. So that has got to be the best personal habit I've got when it comes uh, to business. Okay, so recommend a book for prospective entrepreneurs for all of you out there. Well, I talked about Stephen Pressfield, the book 
that I read and learned about resistance in is called Do the Work. I highly, highly recommend this book. You can read it in two hours. It's a very, very easy read. Um, it's a small little book. And I've listened to interviews with Stephen Pressfield, and he writes just the same way he talks to people, direct and to the point. That's why the book is not 300 pages long, because he can say what needs to be said, and I don't know how long it is, probably 40 or 60 pages, I can't remember. But he can say what needs to be said in that short of time. It is succinct, and it is directly to the point. And it basically says everybody is dealing with something that's holding them back. This is resistance. Get off your butt, get out and do the work, and overcome the resistance. Force your way through it. Great book. After I read that book, I had a whole new level of motivation because I realized, oh, this is not a problem with me. This is something that everybody who wants to be an entrepreneur goes through. Everybody who wants to do something creative goes through this. Okay, once I knew it wasn't just me and I didn't have some sort of problem that was never going to allow me to do these things, I was fine, and I could get moving forward. So I highly recommend that book. Oh, and I highly recommend that you click through the link on the show notes to buy it and help out the Off-Farm Income Podcast. Okay, I'm going to recommend one other book. I mentioned Dan Miller before. 48 Days to the Work You Love is a book that I bought and read probably in 2010 after I discovered his podcast. And thinking back, I can't remember which way it was. If I got the book and then started devouring his podcast or if I started listening to the podcast and then went and got the book. But either way, the book is worth its weight in gold. I bought that book. I've bought that book for friends and those friends have gone on to buy that book for other friends. I have one friend who had that book, had finished reading it, was rereading it, got into a conversation with a gentleman on an airplane and just gave her copy of that book to him and said, you have to read this book. That book shatters perceptions about work, shatters perceptions about entrepreneurialism, and gives you good, concrete ways to go and improve your life. I'm telling you right now, the number one thing that drags us down in life, other than issues with family and things like that, is work. And it's just when we're not in the right fit that it drags us down. Work is not a bad thing. When I was a police officer, my eyes were on my early retirement. Police officers and firefighters, and I think every state, get early retirements because of the shorter lifespans in those careers and the potential lethality in those jobs. And all I could focus on was that early retirement. I knew the exact age I would be when I was able to retire. Retire, retire, retire. That's all I thought about the day I didn't have to work anymore. Once I switched it up, once I found the right fit, I don't think about that anymore. I don't even envision retirement. I don't want to retire. I want to keep working. But I don't want to work doing something that I don't like. I want to work doing something I do like. It's just that now I've discovered there is something you can do that will make you a living, that will pay your bills, that will help you get to the lifestyle you want to be in, and you can enjoy it while you're doing it. And that's absolutely what I want to do, and I never want to stop that. I want my days to be filled with that type of fulfillment. So 48 Days to the Work You Love, also linked through the website, of course, is there, and I highly recommend that. Okay, best way to contact me, well, boy, oh boy, do I say this every week, um, but of course, um, you can contact me um, through my website. My email address is matt at offincome, O-F-F-I-N-C-O-M-E dot com. You can contact me there. Uh, phone numbers are listed on the website. Um, you can get me on Twitter or on Facebook or whatever it may be. Uh, but I've enjoyed sharing this time with you. Uh, the story was actually kind of fun for me to tell, probably a little bit long-winded, but if you've stuck with me all this way, thank you so much. And uh, feel free to contact me at any time. If you want to ask me about these stories or get some clarification, uh, you want to schedule some business coaching, business consulting, or have me come speak, I would love to do any of it. It's all very exciting to me, and I'm loving every minute of it. So thank you very much uh, for tuning in to the Off-Farm Income Podcast this week. It's been my pleasure to talk about my business and what I've described to many people as the vessel leading me uh, to the next stage in my life. And uh, it's a lifestyle vessel is what it is, and it has been fantastic. All right, a couple notes as we go out this week. I have started an affiliate relationship with Dan Miller and 48 Days Internet Radio. 
So you'll see stuff on my webpage now about his podcast and his books, which was there before, by the way. I'd recommended all his books before on my Amazon store. But now I've got a few affiliate links built in there. I really highly recommend him. I've consumed all of his material, all of his podcasts. And boy, he is the guru. He is the inspiration for what I'm doing. And uh, if you'd like to buy any of his materials, I strongly recommend you do that. Especially 48 Days of the Work You Love and his podcast. And you can link through to both of those on my website, which I hope you will do. And for show feedback and guest suggestions, please suggest guests for me. Like I said, finding content can be very difficult. Please contact me. And again, as always, five great ways to support Off-Farm Income. You can like the Off-Farm Income podcast on Facebook. We're called the Off-Farm Income. Or I'm sorry, we're called Off-Farm Income on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter at Matt Breckwald. That's M-A-T-T-B-R-E-C-H-W-A-L-D. All things off-farm income on Twitter appear there uh, at that handle. You can click through our affiliate links, which would be wonderful if you would do that to help support the Off-Farm Income podcast. Subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Boy, I love seeing those subscriptions. Tell a friend either in person or on the web. And as always, enjoy the ultimate lifestyle business of agriculture. Thanks. See you next week.